SoundCloud. There we go. So we are we are now recording. We're talking about learning. Um, I, I I purposely did not record this because I didn't want anybody being on record for voicing their their political views, especially if it's <laughs> not going to be anyway. Um, uh, so anyway, we're talking about learning today, and uh, my example was you're walking in the forest and you see this apple on a tree, and you take that apple, you bite into it, and it satiates you, it satisfies you. Um, what what would lead us to, why would we want to, to learn in that moment where that apple is so we can locate it again? Why is that important for survival? Because the feelings toward having that sensation. Okay. We're trying to satisfy our hunger, right? We're hungry. Um, we've been walking all day. That's been unpleasant. The, the uh, pleasantry came when we found an apple and we were able to satiate our body and satisfy that hunger. Um, do we want to walk around all day again to find another apple? Or are we going to go back to the spot that we just went to previously? I'm going to go back to the spot. We're going to go back to that spot, right? Because we're creatures of habit. We, we are lazy and we are proud. Uh, so we want to shorten um, that expectancy. We want to reduce the time and energy that it takes to seek out food, right? We want routine. And now we've just established a routine. We establish a routine if we go back there again and we get the same result, right? So that's what learning is. So our definition for learning is going to be a permanent, and keeping an eye on that word, change in thoughts and behaviors. Mm -hmm. Due to an experience. Okay, makes sense, right? So why permanent? Why do I say permanent? Because you can't unlearn it. Like once you know, you know, you can like not know anymore. Like just, uh, right. According to neurobiologists, a learning process, whenever we form a memory or whenever we have an experience, uh, electric, uh, uh, um, neural impulses flow through our brains and form a neural pathway. It strengthens a neural pathway. And um, that, you, that cannot be undone unless it is overwritten, which we'll talk about memory next, uh, next week. We'll talk about how we can supersede or um, change memories based on new experiences, right? But we're adapting. We're not necessarily taking away that experience altogether. So it's, it's relatively permanent how we learn. Um, so before we get into what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to play a quick video for you. Stop. New share. Oh, damn, that was another file. I'm gonna have to reboot again. All right, so what, uh, who, who cares to share as to what was happening there? Did, did y'all see the video? I did, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, yep. making sure that came through. All right, so what, what was occurring there? Uh, what was it? Pavlonian conditioning, where he associates the Altoid with the sound of the computer noise. Okay. Now, uh, Jim didn't mention it, but uh, he was he was engaging. Uh, hold on. He was engaging in what kind of conditioning? Pavlonian. I'm not or sure about the right term. Classical. Classical, oops, classical conditioning. You're 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 right. Um, let's see, classical. Classical conditioning. So classical conditioning was a principle or concept that, that was uh, really coined by Ivan Pavlov back in the turn of the century around the 1900s. He was a Russian physiologist, had nothing to do with psychology whatsoever. Um, but just through happenstance, he was, um, he, he was experimenting 
and had a noise that was uh, associated with a dog, uh, with his dog. And um, right before he fed him, he noticed that certain sounds or certain activities caused the dog to salivate instead of the food, right? So he fed his dog because obviously food does what causes a dog to do what? Salivate, right? Cause the dog to salivate, makes sense. Certain things cause us to salivate. Spaghetti and meatballs cause me to salivate or, or pizza, you know? Um, I, I have strong Italian roots, so any Italian food or even garlic just causes me to salivate, right? Um, so what he found is that uh, certain noises associated with food cause the same reaction as the food itself. So he did a little bit further experiment and before he fed the dog, he rang a bell and then provided food. And then notice, took notice of the amount that the dog was salivating, okay? So pretty simple stuff, makes sense. Then he eliminated food. And what happened to his dogs? He rang a bell, what happened to the dog? They started salivating started to salivate. Now does a bell usually cause a dog to salivate? Not unless they know the meaning of the bell. Not, not, to, not something that happens naturally, is it? So what he coined are a couple phrases here that I want you to be familiar with. A neutral stimulus Uh, stimulus, a unconditioned, I'm just going to abbreviate, unconditioned stimulus, an unconditioned response, conditioned stimulus, and conditioned response. Now pay attention to these because this is gonna come up on your assignment for the end of this week. Um, so when I ask for classical conditioning, you're, gonna, you're, you're automatically gonna be thinking neutral stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. Those five terms are probably gonna be the most important and helpful for you to answer your questions. All right, so in this case, in, in Pavlov's dog's example, um, what can we, what would we say the response is? And, and let me kind of preface this before, uh, when I, I work with people that uh, encounter trauma and encounter fear, and I can say in, in just about almost uh, many of those cases, it's, a class, it's classical conditioning that we are dealing with. Um, so working backwards, many of you that are probably going to be it, going into psychology or social work or working with children that uh, have experienced some kind of trauma or adults that have experienced trauma, you're going to kind of use the same model. So we have uh, a, somebody that comes in my office and presents with uh, clusters of, of uh, symptoms. And based on those symptoms, I'm going to immediately try and figure out, well, what's causing those symptoms? All right, is it, what are the triggers? We use the word triggers in those cases. So based on those triggers, we can start having conversations and work backwards. Well, where did those triggers come from? Was it a, a point in their childhood? Was it something that uh, traumatic that had happened in their lives um, that they have paired something innocuous with something natural to cause a natural response, okay? And we usually look at that in fear. And when we get into mental health and treatments of mental health, we're gonna talk more about that. So let's work backwards. Let's look, uh, look at the condition response. So in Pavlov's case, what would we assume is, uh, is happening here with uh, response? What is the response with his dog? Anybody? Salivate. Salivation, right? Salivate, the dog salivates. And working forward, I'm sorry, working backwards, what is the condition stimulus? Now, let, before you answer that, I do want to let you know 
that unconditioned means it naturally happens. So food causes somebody to salivate. Uh, an explosion causes a person to, to cringe, right? Um, uh, uh, what, 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 I'm trying to think what else. Um, if you were to, uh, somebody were to get injured from a dog bite, right? That, that's a natural response. Injury and fear happen from a dog harming us, right? That, that happens naturally. So what was unnaturally occurring here? What was causing the dog to salivate? The bell. The bell, right? Exactly. So a neutral stimulus is something that doesn't naturally occur. So what prior to us classically conditioning the dog, what did not have any association with anything? It didn't occur naturally. What, what was the stimulus? The bell. The bell, again, right? So that we can safely say that the bell and then food is what caused, we already talked about it. Food causes the natural response of uh, salvation. Salvate, okay? So the conditioned stimulus, really simple, is the neutral stimulus plus the unconditioned stimulus equals the conditioned stimulus or the CS, okay? Does that make sense? Are you with yes. me so you with me so far? <laughs> yeah. Okay. One other term that I or two other terms I want you to be familiar with before we move on is generalization. Because this is probably going to come up, this will come up in your assignment as well, and discrimination. Now, generalization. Let me give you an example of this. So um, I have a friend of mine who has severe uh, allergies during the spring months, uh, spring and fall months. Um, so what this person has associated with spring, what do you associate spring with? Flowers. Flowers, right? Flowers, things blooming. So, um, and, and my friend associates spring with flowers. So if I were to hold up a picture of a flower to, to my friend at close quarters, um, this person would start sneezing because they have paired flowers uh, uh, subconsciously, right? Un unintentionally with spring, which spring leads to allergies for them. So they're engaged in something that's called generalization. And once a response is conditioned, once conditioned, a person finds similarity. Similar, oops, similar, similarity, okay in two different stimuli, all right? Similar to those flowers. And we're gonna have an example to show you here in a little bit. Now, discrimination is a little bit different. So we can have generalization and discrimination at the same time. So for example, if I uh, presented my friend with a picture of a flower and my friend sneezes because of that, um, we can say that generalization happens, right? So what happens if I drew a flower? And I'm a, I'm a really terrible artist, so it kind of makes sense that my friend would not respond to the drawing of the, of the flower. So even though it's a flower, and we know that pictures of flowers um, can cause my friend to sneeze, my friend is engaged in discrimination because they're learning, uh, they, they, they learn the ability to differentiate between two similar stimuli. All right, are you with me so far? Yes. Okay, all right, so let's give this a try. Let's see how this, how this looks, shall we? Um, all right. 
give you a couple examples here and we'll try them out and see how you feel about them. All right, can you all see my examples on the screen? Yeah. All right, so um, I'll read these off and you just let me know what, what we think as far as what the stimuli are, okay? And again, let's work backwards. Let's try and work backwards because that works a little bit better. So we're gonna be looking for the neutral stimulus. We're gonna be looking for the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus and conditioned response. Okay. All right. So Geraldine had an automobile accident. Let me get back to normal. Okay. Geraldine had an automobile accident at the corner of 32nd and Cherry Ave. Whenever she approaches the intersection now, she begins to feel uncomfortable. Her heart begins to beat faster. She gets butterflies in her stomach and her palms become sweaty. She experiences anxiety and fear. Very common, I see this a lot in some kind of form in my practice. So let's work backwards because we're troubleshooters and we wanna figure out what's going on here. So we have Geraldine comes into your office and says, um, what, what is her reaction? What are her symptoms? Sweaty palms and butterflies in her stomach. Okay. Anxiety and fear, right? All symptoms of anxiety and fear. You're correct, yeah. But those are, uh, we, we can sum up those by saying anxiety and fear, right? Panic so, attacks. What's that? Panic attacks. Panic oh. attacks, possibly, right? And uh, we'll differentiate the difference, uh, what the differences are between anxiety and panic. Um, they're very close, but and anxiety often does times, uh, oftentimes does cause panic. But um, uh, we'll get into that here in a couple of lessons but anxiety and fear is what we're seeing in this case. So she, Geraldine comes in and says, I'm, exp I'm experiencing symptoms, physiological symptoms of anxiety and fear. And then we're gonna ask what? What causes that, right? What is the trigger to anxiety and fear? And what is Geraldine likely going to tell us? Um, going her route that she went when she had the accident. Right, the intersection, right? Approaching the intersection. Well, that's strange, right? That's really strange. I, I, I don't know many people that approach an, a specific intersection of 32nd and Cherry and experience fear and anxiety, right? That doesn't normally happen. So what can we say uh, the neutral stimulus is in this? Her heart rate. Stimulus, something that causes, the response is the reaction, but what, what causes that reaction? The, the intersection. The accident? Intersection, not, not to the accident yet, because remember, we're investigators. We're trying to figure out what's happening here. So the intersection causes, it doesn't normally, it, it, we call this a neutral stimulus because it has no natural association with anything, right? What does happen naturally here, okay? So we do a little bit more investigating and say, okay, well, we, uh, uh, we, we know that intersections don't normally cause people to be fearful. So what happened? What happened that all of a sudden this intersection is causing you to be fearful? What is- The accident. Accident, exactly. Because the accident causes what? Her heart rate to increase. And anxiety. Right? Think biologically, injury, right? She probably got injured or had a fear of injury, which leads to anxiety and fear, right? Because does it, it's a self-defense mechanism in all of us. We don't want to be injured. We don't want to lose our limbs or lose a lot of blood. It's a self-defense. It's, it's hardwired into us for us not to get injured to fall from. That's why many of us are afraid of heights because we don't have wings, right? We are not uh, born to live in the sky. Uh, we know that uh, if we fall, gravity takes us and we hit the ground and we get hurt. We know this. So therefore that causes fear for some of us. Okay. So um, the intersection is a neut neutral stimulus because once the accident, the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus we're paired, now we have a conditioned stimulus, which causes 
a conditioned response of fear and anxiety. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay, all right. A resounding yes. Hopefully, I, I think you were speaking for the whole class, right, Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's try this again, all right? Now, many of you have probably experienced a very similar situation, so we'll work through this and we'll, we'll uh, describe it. So we've got a couple things going on here, but before we do that, let's identify the neutral stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, uh, conditioned stimulus, and conditioned response, okay? All right, so Bill visited a restaurant in the beginning of November and ordered the chicken. Afterwards, he became extremely sick and nauseated. Ever since then, he has been unable to even think about chicken without becoming nauseated. He went home for Thanksgiving and his mother has cooked a golden brown turkey. He was quite surprised to find that he felt slightly nauseated to the smell and sight of the turkey. However, he didn't feel nauseated to the smell or sight of the roasted duck his cousin brought to dinner. All right, so what's happening here? Again, we're investigators. We're going to work backward, backwards here. Bill comes to us in a session and says, what? What is happening? What is his symptom? He's getting nauseous, like nausea. Nauseated, right? Nauseate, nauseated, nause, uh, nauseated. There we go. Whew. T trouble spelling today and talking, apparently. All right. So what's causing Bill to be, to feel nauseated? The chicken. Okay, so the, 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 the chicken is causing him, right? So what, 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 where would we put that in, in our uh, CS, NS, US, UR? What would that be? CS? CS, right? So chicken, not just chicken, but the thought of chicken the smell of chicken, and what else is causing him to get nauseated? The turkey. Interesting, okay. We're gonna get back around to that here shortly. Um, but turkey also, okay, weirdly enough. All right, so what's our neutral stimulus in this? Anybody? Would it be him going to the restaurant? Is the, well, it would be if he said that the restaurant causes him to get sick, right? Because does the, the thought or, or uh, the thought of a restaurant, does that really make sense? Do, do many people get sick just by walking into a restaurant? Hopefully not, right? But you'd be right if he said what going back to that restaurant made him sick. But instead, the what? Smell. What's that? The smell? Chicken. Okay, okay. Chicken. The experience mm. of getting sick. Chicken and turkey. Chicken and turkey, because do those things normally cause people to get sick? No. Oh. No. Right? So that's a neutral stimulus. If it's something that doesn't naturally cause a reaction or cause a response, then that would be our neutral stimulus. All right. So let's look at what happened naturally in here. What, what, was, what was the uh, response that happened or the stimulus that happened? Who wants to go with the stimulus? Get sick. Sick? Okay. Food, we'll say some kind of food poisoning or virus, right? Yeah. Okay. Caused what to happen? Caused them to get nauseated. Caused them to get sick. Right? Now let me explain what's happening here from a biological perspective because we kind of covered this when we looked at uh, the brain, parts of the brain and, and where things were lo uh, located, right? So this is a very common response and probably many of you can relate to this. How many of you have gotten sick off of something uh, I'm sorry, you got sick and you had a, a reaction to whatever it is you ate last, regardless of whether or not you, that's what caused you to get sick. Does that make sense? Does anybody have a story like that? Yeah. Anybody yeah. Care to share? When I was in like third grade, 
I ate a Rice Krispie treat for the first time. And then like later that day, I ended up getting super, super st- sick. Hmm. And I'm so sure that it wasn't the Rice Krispie treat. But ever since like anything with marshmallow has just made me really nauseous. Okay. Many years later, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else care to share this story? I used to love the spicy, sweet chili Doritos. Like mm-hmm. I loved them. And then one time I got sick and I thought it was cause I was eating them and I stopped li- and I just stopped liking them. Okay. All right. Another natural response. Now let me explain what happened from a biological perspective here. Um, this is a self uh, defense mechanism that's really hardwired into our brain to protect us. Um, we, we need nutrients within our body, but we cannot, we have an adverse reaction to any kind of poisons, right? So our taste and our smell is our best indication of what is, uh, what led to that, that event. We almost go back a, a couple of hours and rewind our, the tapes in our head to remind us what is it that we ate last that potentially poisoned us, okay? And that comes from the uh, olfactory bulb, which is physically co-located with your hippocampus. Your olfactory bulb is responsible for your sense of taste and smell, and your hippocampus is is, uh, responsible for your long-term memory. So when you have a reaction like that, you you automatically um, store that into your hippocampus to remind you that whatever it is you ate potentially poisoned you and to stay away from that at all costs. I had a similar experience to that many, many years ago where I got sick of something that had nothing to do with orange juice, but orange juice was the last thing that I ingested. And for months or almost a year, I couldn't even smell orange juice without becoming nauseated. To this day, I still have a little bit of a trigger. I drink orange juice, but I, I still have a little bit of a, of a memory every time, especially when I tell this story. Now I'm gonna probably not be able to drink orange juice for a while because I just reminded myself of it. Uh, so anyway, that's a self-defense mechanism that's hardwired into us to protect us from ingesting anything poisonous, okay? Now we also had a couple other things going on here, all right? So we talked about generalization. And we also talked about discrimination. Who cares to try and tell me discrimination? What, uh, which, what was going on with these two? What was he discriminating and what was he generalizing? Yeah, mm-hmm. discrimination can be the uh, turkey. It's not actually the chicken, but... Right. Right. So we know that the chicken is what caused uh, caused the, the, the uh, initial reaction, right? But it wasn't the turkey. However, turkey probably, for some reason, to Bill, smells and looks and, and resembles chicken. So he generalized with turkey. What did he discriminate? The duck. The duck. It would, it would make sense. I mean, a duck probably smells a little bit like a chicken and looks a little bit like a a smaller chicken, but for some reason he was able to differentiate uh, uh, turkey and chicken from the duck. We don't know why. Uh, very curious as to why that happens that way, but uh, for some reason it didn't. Okay. How are you all feeling with this? Do you get this or do you want one more example? Can you do one more example? Okay. Uh, Someone has their mic on and we're hearing like... um like static Uh, in the background which is causing us not to be able to really hear you yep it looks like carlos carlos can you put your phone on mute yeah all right appreciate it man thank you all right so let's do one more here by the numbers ns us cs oh oh, i'm sorry uh u c c s c huh Sorry, unconditioned response, uh, conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. All right, so while caring for a friend's dog, you notice that it displays fear-like posture as you roll up a newspaper. You try this several times more and become convinced that this dog is generally afraid of rolled up newspapers. 
All right, so we got a couple things going on here. It's not exactly clear as to what's going on. Now, I, I will tell you, um, similar to this, uh, I work with, with uh, children and, and adults who have experienced trauma. And most times, children don't know how to articulate. Very much like a dog, right? Your dog can't communicate and say, that scares me. So children often don't know how to articulate. So I use this very same process for helping to determine what the triggers are and, and uh, uh, you know, make certain assumptions and, and do a little bit more investigation to find out why that is. So let's work backwards here. What is my, what is my conditioned response? Who wants to take that? The fear. dog is fear. Fear-like posture, right? Yeah. Right, okay. From what? Roll up newspaper. Roll up, Roll newspaper. up newspaper. Oops, newspaper. So what's my neutral stimulus? What doesn't cause something that cause a fear response naturally? The rolled up newspaper. Rolled up newspaper, exactly. So what's going on here? Do we have enough information to say for sure what is happening? I kind of understand it. Okay. You care to share? It, maybe the dog was abused by the newspaper. So anytime he sees the newspaper, he gets scared. Okay. Okay. Injury, which led to fear, right? Fear and anxiety by probably being what? Hit by with the, the newspaper? Hit by the newspaper, right? Injured by the newspaper. Okay, does that make sense? Now the danger in this assumption, especially with working with people, is making assumptions that aren't necessarily correct. Because if we think we know what's going on with a, with a patient or client, we may start inducing certain biases and we may be influencing a story in a certain way um, that, that may affect their memory in a, in, a, in a false way. And we'll get to that when we talk about memories next week. Um, so anyway, we got to be very careful like that, but for the most, uh, for the most part, we can assume that some kind of injury or some kind, something happened to that dog probably repeatedly, um, with the rolled up newspaper and, that's causing a fear because we fear things that harm us. So it would make sense that he was probably harmed in some way or associated that rolled up newspaper with something that does harm him. Um, and it could be your friend. Hopefully it's not your friend. You're picking better friends that don't beat their dogs with rolled up newspapers, but maybe it was a rescue dog, right? Um, that, that, uh, was beat with rolled up newspapers prior to your friend getting them. So anyway, just be careful in your assumptions with those. All right. Do y'all get this? Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. How'd you like the demonstrations? They're good. Okay. Hopefully they'll help you with your, with your homework for this week. Um, I will be covering operant conditioning on Friday. I do break, I, I take a lot of time to explain these because this is difficult fo uh, stuff, folks. Um, uh, but, but the one thing I do want you to take away from this right now is that with classical conditioning, we have the stimulus before the behavior. When we get into operant conditioning, we're going to see the consequence that uh, either increases or decreases the behavior, but the consequence comes after the behavior occurs. So those are the, that, that's really the big difference between the two of those, but I'll go into more details on that on Friday, okay? Any questions regarding the material today? All nope. right. Jen, did we have any questions in the, in the chat that I, I need to address? Nope, um, just a clarification about the assignment, but I answered it. Okay, very good. All right, well, if there's nothing else, folks, I'll stick around for just a couple minutes here. Uh, if you need to speak with me one-on-one, -on -one, 
Uh, I'm going to stop recording.